Is South Africa doing enough to fight xenophobia? Human Rights Watch accuses police and vigilante groups of routinely targeting foreigners. So what's needed to ensure equality for all in the so-called Rainbow Nation? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Imran Khan. Routine and lethal violence against foreigners and indifference from the police. Human Rights Watch says migrants in South Africa are facing increasing numbers of attacks a year after the launch of a national plan to tackle xenophobia. The watchdog found many South Asians and migrants from other parts of Africa living in fear. Police often ignore foreigners who report crimes against them. Some face hurdles getting access to lawyers and public services. A year ago, mobs destroyed foreign-owned businesses and homes. Human Rights Watch says at least 18 foreigners were killed and a few of the attackers have been brought to justice. There have been similar attacks over the years. The report was based on interviews with 51 people in a number of provinces. They reported xenophobic attacks not only by South Africans but also by government and law enforcement officers. Foreign-owned businesses are disproportionately targeted in raids by police who consider attacks on foreigners as routine crimes. Foreigners are often blamed for some of South Africa's biggest problems such as high unemployment rates and crime. The rights group urges South Africa's president to prioritise and fully implement the action plan. It recommends improving social cohesion by forming a task force which includes foreigners. Let's introduce the panel, all joining us from Johannesburg. Dewa Mahinga is a Southern Africa director at Human Rights Watch. Fasia Hassan is a member of the Gauteng Provincial Legislator and also a youth leader. And Ralph Matega is a political analyst and a columnist. I want to welcome you all. Let me begin with you, Dewa. Uh, you're one of the authors of this report. Can you just tell us the main findings? Uh as Human Rights Watch, we have uh, found that xenophobia is a huge challenge in South Africa, particularly because of the failure by the law enforcement agencies uh, to thoroughly investigate and successfully prosecute those who commit xenophobic violence. There is a denialism by the authorities uh, refusing to acknowledge that xenophobia is a challenge and thinking that perhaps uh, criminal acts cannot be classified as xenophobia. These two are not mutually ex exclusive. And as a result, we have found that many victims uh, have no recourse to justice. And the system that is there in South Africa uh, uh, for refugees and asylum seekers does not allow for them to be fully protected uh, within the territory of South Africa. But Dewa, your sample size, size seems to be quite small. You spoke to 51 people. We're hearing that 18 of those suffered from violence. Is this just the tip of the iceberg that you think you're reporting? Well, as Human Rights Watch, we have uh, for more than 10 years been investigating uh, xenophobic violence in South Africa. And uh, I want to let you know that it comes in waves. Uh, so this is uh, an indicator of what was happening in September last year. But... We have been uh, following these issues for many years, including the different waves of violence uh, in different years from 2008, uh, 2015, uh, and also last year, and the attacks on foreign truck drivers. And in all these cases, the patterns are the same of uh, impunity, of no accountability, and of law enforcement agencies not stepping in uh, to ensure that uh, those who commit abuses are punished. So this is... Uh, part of um, a documentation that goes on uh, for more than a decade. But as I understand it, Dewa, there is a national action plan in place. Is that not being enforced? It was agreed upon by all the political parties. It's there. Is that not being enforced? Is that the case? Well, the national action plan, uh, not enough has been done uh, to ensure that it uh, directly tackles and combats xenophobia particularly when we talk of issues of stopping the violence and uh, punishing those responsible. So notwithstanding that uh, there is the National Action Plan, which was launched in March last year, 
we have uh, seen continued violence uh, despite that we have this national action plan. We have seen a continued failure by the police uh, to step in and stop the violence. And uh, we have seen a continued suffering by victims of xenophobic violence, uh, notwithstanding that there is in place a national action plan that was launched by the authorities last year in March. Uh, Fasir Hassan, also in Johannesburg, is there a problem with xenophobia within South Africa or is Human Rights Watch exaggerating? There's definitely a problem of xenophobia in this country. Um, and I think it's particularly pertinent if we, you know, we actually have a term Afrophobia because it goes beyond um, just a generalizing of, of, of people who are foreign nationals. I think it's particularly um, acute when we're looking at um, foreign nationals or others who belong to uh, African countries surrounding South Africa. I think anyone who says we don't have a problem perhaps has their hand uh, or heads rather in the sand. There's most certainly a problem. But when there is a problem and there is a national action plan, often the reason it isn't enforced because there isn't the political will to enforce it. Now, I've been speaking to people in South Africa, friends of mine, who have said, actually, what we're hearing is a lot of language coming out from politicians that, if not directly suggesting that there should be violence against foreigners, but echoing the same sentiments. And we also talked about, they were talked about these waves coming through as well. What's, what's the reason behind this latest batch of violence? Look, it's, I think, like uh, it's been reiterated by Human Rights Watch, there's definitely waves of, of xenophobia. But for me, it's, it's much deeper than that. Um, and one of the things that I think we do need to be looking at is, you know, in South Africa, there's a huge focus on identity politics. Um, and it really is also a legacy from apartheid and from colonialism in which, you know, people identify or, or draw worth from the group of people that they're from. Um, and I find that it's also playing itself out on a much larger scale. So we're seeing these xenophobic elements. But the truth of the matter also is that apart from the prejudice that exists, this is also a hugely economic issue. Um, so one of the big things that you hear from people on the ground and from general citizens um, is that they feel that their jobs are being taken. They feel that they don't have enough economic opportunity. And then that in turn plays itself out with that prejudice. And then the target of that anger, um, yes, of course, you get service delivery protests. But that target is also foreign nationals who are doing piecemeal jobs in um, township communities, for example, or who own what we call small grocery spaza shops in the communities as well. And those are often the people who are, I suppose, at the front line um, of that prejudice. So for me, there is an anthropological way for us to deal with this, but it's also very important to acknowledge that it also is born out of poverty, severe poverty um, that our people are suffering from. And, and you need a multi-pronged approach, really, um, I think, to address it. Uh, Ralph Matega also in Johannesburg. A multi-pronged approach is what's needed, says uh, our other guest. Now, what is, what is the approach currently from the government when it comes to dealing with not just xenophobia, but actually identity politics within South Africa? Do they have a concrete plan of action? Well, to start with xenophobia, the approach in government at the moment has been denial. I mean, I went through the report, uh, the Human Rights Watch report, and I think that uh, the usefulness of this report, the importance is that uh, it goes deeper into dealing with the question that has concerned us the most, those of us who look into those issues. It is the attitude of uh, state power when it comes to xenophobia. I mean, my colleagues have, have, have spoken there about uh, that it is actually a problem, but it looks as if it is not something that is at the center of uh, South Africa's politics. I mean, uh, there seems to be this view in South Africa that uh, uh, you, you, you have a, a hierarchy of importance of, of issues. The, the most important thing is the economic challenges of majority of the poor people, and, and therefore maybe issues around uh, xenophobia, maybe even issues around uh, gender-based uh, violence. Those maybe are seen as a little bit uh, lower on the hierarchy of things. So uh, until we have a holistic approach that seeks to understand how all these things are intertwined, I'll give you a quick example. We are generally a country that is a, 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 a battling with crime. So it, xenophobia will certainly follow those lines of uh, crime and so forth. So when, when, when issues come out, Sometimes our politicians tend to say that, look, it has got nothing to do with xenophobia, it's pure crime. And we say sometimes to them that it doesn't have to be purely xenophobia. It has to go alongside some of the challenges that are encountered within the country. But yet it is still xenophobia. So you need a shift of attitude from the get-go. The big problem is denial. 
in, uh, among those who exercise power. I mean, I, I, I'm quite happy to hear a member of the provincial legislature on this panel saying that uh, it is actually a problem. Perhaps it will become the center of politics in South Africa. But at this point, it remains a peripheral issue in terms of at least the attitude that I see government express. I mean, throughout the whole report, this report is trying to, to address each and every department that is responsible. I've never seen such a, a desperate report, almost speaking to each and every line department in government. It speaks to the question of the attitude that, look, let us accept it. There is xenophobia. We will deal with the embarrassment of that, but let's come up with a solution. And the best way is to accept that it exists. Uh, Fasia Hassan, you are a member of the provincial uh, legislator. Uh, Ralph is suggesting that you might be a lone voice in actually wanting to deal with all of this. Are you a lone voice? Are people or are people actually listening to you in government? Look, I think it is nuanced, OK? And what I mean when I say that is, you know, Ralph gave a good example. Sometimes when things are reported, they're reported purely as crime and they don't identify xenophobia as an attachment to it. And often because of the different sort of labels and boxes people have, they're like, it's either crime or it's either xenophobia. It's either gender-based violence or it's either this. Um, and I think that's part of the problem, right? We need to look at this as a holistic problem in society because that's also when you start to see that all of these different issues have linkages and they all have shared struggles and elements. Um, and that's why I sort of, Imran, spoke a little bit about the economics of it, because that's fundamentally important. You can even link our high crime rate to a lack of economic opportunity and a lack of employment. Um, so for me, I think what's particularly important is identifying those key drivers, which I think the report does very well. And I actually want to welcome the report. I think it's very detailed and comprehensive. And then use those different keys that link each other to focus on those. Um, but yes, is it is it a difficult thing to talk about? Definitely. Um, I think it's particularly difficult given the, the history that we come from, right? I'm a young person in this space, but a lot of the people that we work with were um, alive during and, and sort of fought against apartheid. So for them, you know, lifting up the mirror to one's face is always a bit difficult because one never can then identify themselves in a, in a negative position, you know? Um, and that's not to say that people don't care about it. It's to say that I think the approach, and, when, and Ralph and someone else said this, the approach is what needs to change and the approach is what's particularly important. Um, and that's also, by the way, what the report says. We need to publicly, openly call out xenophobia for what it is. Actually, Deva, uh, the report is quite extraordinary. One of the few that I've actually read where you do list almost every single government department as being responsible. It goes from the judiciary to the government to the police. There are quite specific examples that you've given, but you don't have a voice in the government. Is there anybody listening to you? Well, we hope that uh, the authorities in South Africa are listening and we are reaching out through the media and also uh, setting up uh, meetings to engage directly and present our findings. Because, yes, it is important for those in power to listen to and to hear our recommendations uh, for South Africa to be able to move forward. But not only that, we are also saying that the issue of xenophobia should not be isolated uh, to be a South African challenge alone. We need to have it addressed within the Southern African Development Community, SADC, and also at the African Union level. At the United Nations level, the UN level, there is the uh, special rapporteur responsible for issues around racism and uh, intolerances and xenophobia. And we also want to bring this uh, to her attention so that there can be a collective concerted effort uh, to find a lasting solution, which should be led by the South African authorities, but with support from other key players uh, regionally and globally. I mean, Ralph, that's a very interesting point, because if you look at the countries that border South Africa, Mozambique, for example, has an insurgency going on. That's driving a lot of people into South Africa. There's a lot of racism towards people coming in from other African countries. I think the word Afrophobia was used uh, just earlier. Um, that is a wider issue. That's an issue for not only the southern South African government, but for SADC and for even the African Union, surely. That's somewhere, something that needs to be worked on on an international level indeed i mean you need a regional response to this quite often when one listen to some of the political leaders in south africa uh, you, you can sense a frustration 
Uh, and I don't think it is a justifiable frustration, but I do sense a frustration where sometimes the leaders in South Africa, political leaders, uh, are almost saying that, look, there is no regional response here. This looks like it is South Africa's problem. At a regional level, what you often see is when other African nations, African leaders are quite angry, sometimes walking away from conferences. Uh, I remember very well uh, the report that, uh, that we are discussing here. It came after those uh, events last year. I remember very well Paul Kagame, the president of Rwanda, actually saying that he's not coming to Durban because of uh, the problem. Of, there was a conference in South Africa, I remember, that he was not coming because of this uh, xenophobic violence. And my view, actually, I was quite critical, say that, uh, but President Kagame, it will be better to go and engage South African leadership on this. Working away does not help. Us against them approach will not help. We need a stronger uh, a regional response. But I have to say as well that uh, at a regional level as well, the problem at a regional level is that you have so many issues. I mean, uh, you, you're correctly pointing to the Mozambique, uh, the Capo Delgado situation there. Uh, we have been talking about the Zimbabwe, the crisis of the opposition in Zimbabwe. Those are some of the issues that seems to be overwhelming uh, 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 the regional leaders. But I think regional leaders need to understand that uh, you don't need to have a hierarchy of problems. Problems are, inter, are interrelated. Uh, a typical citizen will come through various forms of uh, uh, engagement in a day. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a clean issue. You don't have to say that I'm starting now to dealing with xenophobia. You just have to make sure that within your policies, there is, um, there is sensitivity to all of this. You, 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 there is no opportunity to just wake up and say, today is only gender-based violence. We don't live in societies such as that. We don't live in a lab. We live in a real society. So at the regional level, you need that kind of an approach coming out where leaders are going to undertake to take a regional approach. But I have not seen it at this point, to be honest with you. Uh, Fasia Hassan, not to defend anybody who is xenophobic, but do you have an understanding of where people might be coming from? Now, this is less about, say, for example, people fleeing war, uh, fleeing political violence within their own countries and coming to South Africa, but there are economic migrants here as well, people who are coming to South Africa, making money, and there are some legitimate concerns, perhaps, that from South Africans that that money is going abroad, it's not being reinvested back in the country. Is that an issue for you? I think that's a very big issue. Um, and as much as I have my own personal views on the matter, and I think, yeah, quite rightly, let's separate refugees. Um, and that's a difficulty as a public representative because quite a few South Africans, you know, I'd hazard a guess and say, you know, the majority of the poor economic sort of working class are raising these issues with us. And they're saying exactly that, um, that there are many sort of economic immigrants and what are we doing to protect South African interests? Um, and it's a very difficult thing to answer, especially, I think, coming from yeah, where we do, the fact that South Africa, our liberation came about, particularly because of what we call the frontline states, Zambia, Zimbabwe, um, you know, Botswana, those people who, who really took us in when we were fighting the apartheid state. Um, but it's there. And I, and I think, Ibrahim, in order to, uh, for us to have a, a genuine sort of solution-orientated approach, we do need to acknowledge it. And that's why I spoke earlier around that economic element. So for me, when I talk about that multi-pronged approach, I agree fully with the report around better training of police officers, changing the curriculum to include immigration, refugee rights, etc. But in addition to that, we also have to be providing better economic opportunities for our people, because if you don't, it does play itself out in many different ways. Um, and then we're putting in a difficult position because as politicians, um, your constituency is saying to you, well, we're not looked after, we're really suffering, and yet here somebody else has... So you know, we don't want you to ever get to a point of a he said, she said kind of thing. What we want to do is have a preventative approach and create opportunities um, for people on the ground. And even today, we were having discussions um, around regulation regulation of small businesses so that we can, um, you know, where a South African has the relevant skill, they can be prioritized. But that's not to say that we're going to take a xenophobic approach. And I think that's why we have to be um, honest in what we're calling out as xenophobia, but at the same time, also provide those opportunities. But it's a very difficult balance to strike. Um, and it's something I'm learning yeah, in office very quickly, that it's not yes or no or right or wrong. Yeah, oh, this is often the case, actually. Um, Diva, Diva uh, Mavinga, um, in your research, did you notice a difference in people's attitudes towards people who were refugees and people who were coming into the country as economic migrants and opening up businesses? It, or was there, the, the xenophobia was there simply to any foreigner? 
Well, what we noticed was that, um, especially in the informal settlements, for example, around Deben and around Hauteng, Deep Slut, uh, in those areas, uh, targets uh, for xenophobic uh, violence and sentiments have been to the poorest of the poor amongst the asylum seekers. Uh, those who are, um, we have got small spaza shops uh, in the townships. Uh, and uh, the biggest problem was vulnerability or the lack of protection, uh, for example, from the police. Uh, in Durban, there is an informal settlement called Benwood, where the police told us that they will not go in there uh, when it is night, between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., primarily because they too are afraid uh, that they don't have enough uh, security, so they will not police that settlement. The best or the only thing would be for those affected by xenophobia to come out. But, um, and so uh, for the most part, it's a, 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 a class issue. Uh, the well of the economic migrants with, with the higher end jobs uh, executives have not been uh, as targeted and they perhaps live in secure places. But what we have also noticed is that the attitudes uh, from law enforcement uh, is somewhat similar when when dealing with uh, migrants, and we are now receiving reports of how uh, uh, the economic migrants who may be lawfully uh, legally working with all the documentation are increasingly finding it difficult to navigate within the legal framework because of xenophobic sentiment and attitude uh, from the law enforcement authorities. But when it comes to violence, to attacks, to the looting and destruction of property, is predominantly in the informal settlements, targeting the poorest of the poor. Ralph, there is a hardening of attitudes from the South African government. This is not the first time they've been criticised for anything. I mean, let's take, like you said earlier, they've been criticised for gender-based violence, for mismanagement of the economy, now for xenophobia. It seems to me that there is a just a fatigue from the South African government that suggests that they're not going to do anything about this because, A, they can't, and, B, it's just yet another report that they're reading and they're just going to put it in another drawer and try and deal with the problems of the day rather than the long-term problems. Indeed, there is fatigue. I mean, uh, you listen to uh, uh, people in the, in the home affairs, you ask them about uh, 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 the immigration policy, what policy do we need to have in place. Most often you can see they will quickly point out to borders that are being overwhelmed. You speak to people in the health sector, they will point to some of those things. Again, we also need to acknowledge that in most cases, uh, the most vulnerable are the ones that are usually uh, used as a scapegoat to, to explain some of the challenges. It cannot be, for example, that the reason why the health system is having trouble in South Africa is because of people who are coming from outside South Africa. There is a class issue of saying that those that are poor, downtrodden, are the ones that are going to be uh, 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 taking, shouldering all the ills in society. And unfortunately, that is also the pattern of xenophobia in South Africa. Fasir Hassan, you're a, a young person, you're in politics, you have an opportunity to be a bit more energetic perhaps than other politicians of the past, but you're going to face an uphill struggle getting the South African government to hear you on things like gender-based violence, on mismanagement of the economy and on xenophobia, which is what we've been talking about today. It is an uphill battle. Do you have any friends in the government, any allies that may help you in your struggle? Definitely. And I think last year, September, was a really good example of this. Uh, we saw a huge insurgence of xenophobic violence. And in fact, um, the Gauteng Premier, David Bakura, um, sent us to go into our constituencies onto the ground. Um, in the space that I come from, or the constituency that I represent, there's a large Somalian Muslim immigrant community there. Um, and what we found, one, I mean, we were literally in the informal settlement and two people were shot while we were there. Um, in fact, there were South Africans, but it was in self-defense. And what we really need and I think this is the, the important part. You need politicians who are going to be on the ground. You need policymakers who are going to take their gloves off and say, well, let's speak with our communities. Let's talk with um, the marginalized groups. And let's come to some sort of a social compact where we work together. Um, and I'm saying this because we have, in theory, some good policies. We don't have the greatest, but, I mean, we have some good policies. But we need people on the ground and we need people like myself to really acknowledge where the problems are and go to our people. And that's exactly what we did in September. In that community, we were able to make some inroads, but it's, it's a small example and really it's a drop in the ocean. And I think we need to be a bit more systematic in our approach. I want to thank all our guests. 
Dewa Mavinga, Fasia Hassan, and Ralph Matega. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the whole team here in Doha. Bye for now.